Um, did anyone see my talk at New York? Was anyone in New York? A couple people? Maybe? No one? Okay. Well, one. One person. Um, so, hi everyone. My name is Mike McDonald. Uh, I'm an engineer and product manager at Google. Um, and somewhat jokingly, the other talk in the other room is called The Future of Serverless. So I thought it would be funny to riff on that and talk about the past of serverless. Um, so how many people have heard of Firebase? Is anyone? Oh, most of the room. So you got, I won't even do a demo then. Um, you guys all know Firebase is a backend as a service. It started as a real-time database that allowed clients to connect directly to a database, synchronize JSON in real time. Um, if you guys went to Alexander's talk on Realm, where he was talking about syncing objects from devices to the cloud, um, we sync JSON, which is a JavaScript object from the device to the cloud. Um, so we've actually been doing serverless uh, since about 2011. Um, so if you went to Charity's talk, where she was like, oh, we've been doing serverless before it was a thing. Um, we've been doing serverless since before it was a thing. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about building serverless framework. So taking a, an existing server that you have um, and making it serverless and kind of what defines serverless. Because we've already defined that serverless has servers. Everyone knows that. There are data centers. At, this is a Google data center. Um, there are a ton of these. There are AWS data centers. Everyone has data centers. Everyone has servers. Serverless still involves dealing with servers. Serverless also deals with writing server code. There's no escaping that. People are writing functions as a service, which is just encapsulated server-side logic. Um, this is a cloud function, um, but again, you're writing server-side code. What people haven't really been talking about, we've been talking about the benefits of not using servers, but we haven't really been talking about why people used servers. Everyone kind of glossed over that. And there are kind of two main reasons that we have to address. We have to address security and trust. So you need to go ahead and ensure that your clients are not malicious because they probably are going to be. So you need to know who they are and ensure that they only have specific permissions. And then you also have to deal with the other side, which is servers are powerful. Servers can do complex backend logic that may be the secret sauce to your application that you don't want to go ahead and ship to all of your clients. So there are certain things that servers are very useful for. And you have to go ahead and handle those if you want to build a serverless architecture. So our server architecture in the past, your device would go ahead and connect to some application server that would handle authentication, authorization, and that trusted business logic. It maybe would do quota deductions. It would do payment processing. It would have all of your API keys. Um, and it would connect to the various infrastructure pieces. Those could be databases, message queues, file storage systems. So uh, as you guys saw, I think uh, Tim Wagner, like battered servers with hammers uh, or baseball bats, and in Japan, cut one of these things in half. We want to get rid of that middle tier. Serverless is all about going ahead and connecting your applications directly to powerful managed infrastructure. So in Firebase land, that was a JSON real-time database. We've expanded that to file storage solutions and a bunch of other things. Your clients should be able to connect directly to the cloud. So how do we go ahead and get there? This talk is all of the pieces, and we'll actually go into live coding in a minute on how we can go ahead and get rid of that middle tier by allowing clients to connect directly to the cloud. Cool. So the first piece that we need to go ahead and deal with is authentication. And so authentication is the process of understanding who your users are, your end users. And so they could come in through social providers or an email password account, uh, anonymous users as well. Quick poll of the audience. How many people have applications, like running web apps or mobile apps? How many of them have authentication? Most of them. Um, social providers, Facebook, Twitter, any of them? Yep, email password. Anyone run their own email password system? A couple people. So you have databases, and you're hopefully salting and hashing your passwords and doing all of that complexity. Um, I would also consider uh, the easier way of doing things is using an identity as a service provider. So have you guys heard of Auth0, for instance? That's a really well-known one. Uh, or Firebase Authentication. We have our own uh, kind of serverless authentication system that allows you to log in with different social providers, email password, anonymous users. Uh, Microsoft Active Directory is another example of one of these. Um, and have you guys heard of OAuth? OAuth tokens? How many of you guys have implemented OAuth? Is anyone? Yeah, how many enjoyed implementing OAuth? Exactly, no one. Inf OAuth is not, is not fun to use, um, yet a lot of APIs end up using them. Um, we and some other folks end up using JSON web tokens. They're a little bit more flexible, and I'll show you why. You can kind of just shove in arbitrary payloads and then evaluate those server side. And so it's super, super powerful if you have a JSON web token minting service, you can go ahead, 
on the server, put in some claims, and then all of your, your end devices can go ahead and use those claims for various different authentication things. And I'll show you that. So we'll actually go ahead um, and I'll jump over to the Firebase console and I'll show you how, we, how we've gone ahead and implemented this on the server. So you can go ahead and replace the code that you would otherwise write with this configuration. So if you want to go ahead and build a serverless framework, you can just show your end developer something that looks like this, which is a checkbox that would say, enable this authentication provider. And so you've gone ahead and switched code that you would otherwise have to write as a developer to some configuration that you can provide to your developers in the form of you know, enabling a checkbox or in the really harsh case, you have to stick in um, some information from the developer on you know, putting in their Facebook app ID in secret or other things like that. Cool. So switching to the next big topic is authorization. So once you know who your users are and you've authenticated them, you need to be able to tell your system what they can do. So that's typically in the realm of authorization. And there are a couple kind of broad topics in authorization. You have resource-based authentication, which would be, have you guys heard of CloudKit, for instance, uh, which is Apple's kind of backend as a service, or the folks at Realm. Um, resource-based would basically be you have a database, and maybe that database is entirely public or user private. Um, and so kind of it's, it's very coarse-grained. Um, so yeah, like for, for, for instance, both of those, uh, CloudKit is, they have a private one, a user private one, and a public one. For Realm, you can go ahead and they have a public one, a user, uh, a user private one, uh, and group-based ones. Going down a bit, um, you have a thing called role-based access control, which would be uh, pretty much every IAM policy for uh, like AWS, Google Cloud Platform, uh, and it's, it's also the method used by, if you guys have heard of Parse or Horizon, um, both of those have kind of role-based uh, access control on their, their entities. And that's basically saying, you are this person, you have read access to this resource, or you have write access to this resource. Um, and then you have a thing called attribute-based access control. Um, so that's what Firebase has used. Um, and I can go ahead and show you that in a minute. And what that basically means is, not only can you evaluate who that user is and what role they are, but you can evaluate any arbitrary property. So you could go ahead and say, um, you know, this user has an email address with this domain, or they come from this IP, or we've added uh, information about the request that they've made, and so this is the fifth request that they've made, so disallow it. Um, it's very, very flexible. Um, there's a thing called XACML, which is a, a really nice way of defining it, um, but it's a little cumbersome because it's XML based. But we've gone ahead and created a thing, uh, and this is, I think, part of what made Firebase so successful is we went ahead and said, no longer do you have to write authorization or, or authentication code. You can just go ahead and specify this JSON blob that says, you know, so-and-so can do X based on any of these attributes. And we've defined this really cool framework. Um, I actually heard it uh, in, in another form in one of the IBM talks, um, but it's essentially an event condition action framework. And so you have some event, which is a request to, for instance, this would be an endpoint users slash Mike. The dollar sign is a wild card, so you can go ahead and put in anything there. So I want to go ahead and read data at users slash Mike, and that's my event. And I have a condition based on that that says you can do that only if your authentication status is non-null, so you have to be logged in. And the action here would be then allow the read if the condition is true for that event. Um, and it's actually a really powerful framework. Uh, IBM, I think, described it as trigger rule action. So you had the trigger, which was you know, an event, which was an HTTP request coming in to that endpoint, the rule, which is that condition, uh, and then action, because we're actually doing something. And I can go ahead and quickly show what that looks like in the Firebase database. So I have... Um, I built a, a sample app from a while back that's just a chat app that has some user information and some messages. And I can go over to this rules tab. And I actually wrote really complex rules um, because I wanted to go ahead and really secure my data. Um, and you can go ahead and see that I have information about my messages, that I'm going ahead and doing schema validation on my properties. So I'm saying, yes, these all have to be strings or numbers. They only, you know, I can only write this bit of data. I can't write other data. Um, it's an incredibly, incredibly powerful and flexible system. And in the next couple minutes, we're going to build one of these. It'll be a lot of fun. 
But let's go ahead and I'll show you the next piece. So you can go ahead and authenticate and authorize, which solves kind of the security issue. Um, but now you have to go ahead and what if you want to make calls to another API or you need to have API keys stored somewhere? And so that is, oh, I get to, everyone look at my beautiful animations. Um, the other part is eventing. So you can go ahead and now react to changes that have been made in your data model or in your service. Um, honestly, you've seen probably four or five uh, infrastructure providers who do this exact thing. This is what everyone kind of traditionally defines as serverless is functions as a service. Um, but really, it's only one piece of that. And that is, you know, kind of the not having to go ahead and manage infrastructure and let people execute arbitrary code that they've uploaded. Um, honestly, just use one of them. I'm going to build one here. Um, please, dear God, never use it. Um, I'm evaling JavaScript. It's totally insecure, uh, but it's great for a demo. Um, and even better yet, if you guys went to Charity's talk where she said, don't rely on infrastructure providers, use any of them or all of them. Um, go ahead and kind of abstract away what the actual infrastructure is. If you're building a platform like this, if you're building a serverless platform, the goal is to abstract the, the underlying infrastructure away from your end developers. So they shouldn't care if you're using Lambda or Cloud Functions or Azure Functions or OpenWhisk. You should be using any and all of them in case one of them fails. So they upload arbitrary JavaScript and you execute it however you can, um, either because of cost or performance reasons or reliability. Cool. So we're going to go ahead and build our own event condition action framework. Um, that's the poop emoji rules. It's terrible, it's bad, but it's 150 lines of code, and it's going to show you exactly how we built Firebase and how you could build your own serverless framework. Um, so we're going to use Express, because it's Node, and everyone here is hopefully familiar with, with Node and Express. Um, and so we're going ahead and building uh, the event, which is an HTTP method at some Express route. We have some condition that we're going to evaluate to say whether or not we should allow the request. And then we're going to go ahead and uh, have an action that's just arbitrary JavaScript code that we'll go ahead and execute if that request is successful. Um, so it's live coding time, because everyone loves live coding time. So is that large enough? Can everyone see that back of the room? Cool. Um, so I have an app over here called server.js. Um, and so that is, imagine you have some application that exists today. Um, presumably, you've already written authentication code that goes ahead and does OAuth or JSON web tokens or whatever. You have some authorization code um, that you have written that does some prescribed set of rules. And you could be doing your own role-based or access or attribute-based access control. Um, but the point is, if I wanted to go ahead and start using your platform, what are you going to do? Are you going to ship me this JavaScript code and say, oh, you just modify these you know, seven lines to have it do whatever you want and spin it up in DigitalOcean or uh, App Engine or an EC2 instance? Um, you could do that, but that's not hashtag serverless. right? We're not here because we want that. Um, we're here because we want to go ahead and host that so someone else can go ahead and take, you know, instead of writing code, write some configuration that they can just deploy and use in a multi-tenant system. It's really cool. So um, I built a simple app that we're going to make serverless. And all it does is it uh, we have a get that goes ahead. And if you say get a username, we'll go ahead and return some JSON user profile. Um, and if you put JSON there, um, we'll actually go ahead and save that JSON to, um, I use Google Cloud Storage. It's Amazon S3 effectively. It's just blob storage in the cloud. Um, I built Firebase Storage. Uh, which is literally just Google Cloud Storage plus the things that make uh, serverless a thing, so authentication and authorization. Um, so this is actually like a product that we built that's doing really, really well um, because you can go ahead and connect directly to managed and uh, directly to, to infrastructure from a client in a secure way. Cool. So the first thing that we want to do, I will just copy this to a file I call serverless.js. So this is not a server. Um, and so clients will be able to just go ahead and use this in a managed fashion uh, to go ahead and uh, essentially build a serverless platform for getting user profile information. So we'll go ahead and save that. Um, the first thing that we want to do is we want to go ahead and instead of writing any code uh, to go ahead and do the authentication, we want to swap that out for um, a configuration-based way. And so. I'm going to just go ahead and because actually writing uh, my own token vending stuff would be kind of a pain, um, I used a thing called uh, JWT.io to create JSON web tokens. So this is a thing by Auth0. It's really, really cool. 
Um, and it basically lets you uh, paste a JSON web token in um, and change the parameters of it. So I can go ahead and do something like that and get a JSON web token back because um, I didn't want to go ahead and build this whole thing. Check it out. It's super, super helpful for debugging. Uh, and what I'm going to do is we're going to go ahead and essentially parse that JSON web token. Um, if it exists, we're going to go ahead and set this auth variable to that, and we're going to pass that auth variable down. Um, and if it's not authenticated, we're going to go ahead and return an error. So this is kind of the zeroth order stage. Um, notice I have some comments. You should probably validate your JSON web token. So uh, you can go ahead and do, essentially, they have like a public-private key pair. You can go ahead, get the public key, validate that it's correct, check that it's not expired, do some things like that. Um, I'm going to gloss over that. It's a demo. but. Uh, in case you ever want to go ahead and either take this code and re-implement it uh, or do it yourself, please do the right thing. And so to prove that we can go ahead and do this, uh, I will go ahead and start serverless.js. So I have npm start, opens a port, and then I have a bunch of tests over here. So I'll go ahead and quickly we will curl user's mic and boom, get an error. That's nice because that goes ahead and tells us we don't have a token. We can go ahead and put it in with a token, and boom, we get some data back. That's awesome, because we just went ahead and showed how to do authentication. We just put a token on, does the correct thing, and it returns us JSON data. Awesome. We're like a third of the way done, guys. And by the way, all that was basically doing was it was getting a profile file and returning us the JSON data for that file. Awesome. Um, I also have this other utils file that just helps me out. It does the actual file transfer and then has this fun function called pure eval um, that you'll see in a minute how we go ahead and use that. Cool. So the next thing that we want to do is we want to go ahead and do authorization. So we've already handled the authentication part. We now want to handle the authorization. So we know who the user is. We want to basically say what that user can do. And so this is a two-part operation. So the first is we have to go ahead and say what the user can do. And so we have um, this rules file. It's called rules.json. And again, we have an express route. And we have two operations. We have get and put. We have the condition. And we have an action. So the condition is going to say, uh, in this case, if false, uh, allow a get at user slash user ID. So essentially, this would never succeed. So let's just go ahead and make that if true. Uh, we'll go ahead and allow that condition to succeed. So we need to go ahead and be able to upload this file so that the, our serverless framework can go ahead and download that file um, and evaluate it and take those rules, evaluate the context of the rule, and say yes or no to allow or deny the request. So we have to do a couple things here. We're going to have to go ahead and add a bunch of code to go ahead and we're going to get a rules file. So we have to go ahead and say rules file, and we'll call that rules.json. And we want to go ahead and get that file. And then with that data, we're going to go ahead and capture some environment data. So we basically want to go ahead and there is an environment that has uh, things like the context of the request, the data that we're writing. So that's rec.body would be like the data that we're writing. Um, parameters of the request that would have things like um, the actual route, the HTTP method. Um, and we want to go ahead and be able to evaluate the condition with that environmental context. And that will allow us to do really complex things like say, oh, hey, when you go ahead and write, the user ID that you write to has to equal a value in that token. And that's really the power of the serverless framework is you've taken what would otherwise be a line of code hard-coded into your app and given that to the end developer to change as they want. So you can go ahead and just do things on the fly. It's really, really, really powerful. And this is how we do it. We basically go ahead, capture some environment, and then we need to go ahead and get the correct condition. So we need to essentially traverse that JSON object to get a condition, which is essentially just, we can go, this is the path, this is the HTTP method, this is the field name condition, we want to get this value. And then we want to go ahead and run our pure eval function. Uh, that will go ahead and take that condition and literally just JS eval it with that additional environment. 
And so if we go ahead and allow that, we'll go ahead and move on to the next thing. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and say that it's unauthorized. So we can go ahead. That's awesome. The one thing that we have to do is you have to go ahead and upload that file. So the developer of your application, so this would be like an end user request, we'll go ahead and get that. But the developer has to be able to go ahead and upload that file. So we're going to go ahead and add another thing. And we want to go ahead and add another express endpoint to handle our rules. And I'll actually move that to right after authenticate, because we want to be authenticated. But specifically, we want to go ahead and have, uh, we'll, we'll call it an admin condition. So we want to go ahead and say, not any end user can upload the rules, only an admin user. So uh, you could have like a database secret or some other secret that only the developer knows that they can go ahead and use to upload. Um, in my case, I went ahead and just made a token with a field called is admin set to true. And presumably, only the developer could go ahead and mint one of those tokens. Um, and so that's pretty much good enough. We have to go ahead and also add a piece of middleware that will go ahead and do that. So basically, all it just says is, does is admin exist? Is it true? If it's not, go ahead and say, hey, this operation requires admin credentials and move on. And then we go ahead, get our rules file. If we can get it, awesome. Otherwise, no. So let's test this out. So I will unfortunately don't have live reload. So we'll restart our server. And we'll try a couple things. So over here in tests, we will go ahead and try deploying our rules file. And first, we'll just do it without a token. See what happens. Yes, I want to paste those lines. Cool, cool. Unauthenticated. That's awesome, because we didn't have a token. We failed early. We said, you can't do this. Let's go ahead and try doing this now. Yeah, I want to paste that. And then and token equals. We'll go ahead and copy it from above. Paste the token. Boom, error operation requires admin credentials. Awesome. So we went ahead and verified that that works. And now we'll go ahead and copy the whole thing. Paste it in. And OK, 200 OK. Awesome, we've uploaded a file. So now we can go back. And let's go ahead and try our test again. So if we look at our rules that we uploaded, condition is true. Anyone should be able to go ahead and read a profile. So we're going to go ahead, paste that in. Oh, error. That's not fun. What did I do wrong? Do, do, do. Ah, cool. So what I need to do, um, I forgot about this. Um, the unfortunate part about uh, Express Middleware is basically it doesn't capture certain pieces. I have to do it here. We'll go ahead and do that and restart the server. And let's try it now. Boom. And we go ahead and get a buffer back. So that's awesome. We went ahead and showed that you can go ahead and write rules that do something, in this case, allow anything to happen. And we'll go ahead uh, and, and actually evaluate that. Um, this is the fun part, though. Let's change that to false. So I went ahead and just changed the rules. Notice up here, have not changed the server at all. This is just, it could be running anywhere. And now I'm going to go ahead and upload a new set of rules where I don't allow reads. Again, nothing changing on the top. Uploaded new rules. And now I'm going to try and get. And what do you guys think is going to happen? Am I going to be able to get anything? No, unauthorized. Everyone should be clapping now, because that was actually kind of impressive, right? I didn't change the server, but I changed the behavior of the server based on configuration that a developer uploaded. We just made a server serverless. Yes. Again, no one's clapping. Thank you. I have to get you guys, yeah, got to get you guys moving. Um, so that was really kind of, like, again, hilariously unsafe. Please never write conditions like this, um, because I could, like, put a string in, and that would technically evaluate to true. Um, the point is, though, Again, we made a server serverless. So that was half the battle. We went ahead and authentication and authorization. Now we want to go ahead and react to events. So we can go back to serverless. And let's go ahead and write some middleware 
to do actions. So we do authentication, authorization here, and then we go ahead and run our code. And we want to go ahead and after that, we want to go ahead and perform some action. So we'll quickly modify the signatures of our handlers to say, hey, you should go ahead and do something next. We should probably also not go ahead um, and actually return at that point because we want to go ahead and write some middleware to do actions. So this could be calling out to some functions as a service. Um, in our case, what it's doing is the developer uploads a JavaScript file that I'll call actions.js um, that has some number of functions. Uh, we literally, again, eval that file so it gets in our JavaScript environment and then allow the developer to execute those arbitrary things um, because, yeah, security, everyone loves that. Um, and so we'll go ahead, we essentially pull that file down. We go ahead and um, we already parsed out what the action is from that rules file and then we call eval and we're going to just say, yep, evaluate that. Um, and essentially what will happen is anytime the request is authorized, we'll go ahead, run our kind of service provided logic, and then we will run the developer provided logic. Um, ideally, we do this transactionally. Um, I'm writing a demo, so oh god, no, everything can fail. Um, but let's go ahead, and we've done that. And then we want to go ahead and say act as the last thing that we do. And so the act will go ahead and actually end our HTTP or error out. So we want to go ahead. And we do have to restart our server while adding new functionality. So we will restart it. We will go ahead and so I wrote a function called logger that just logs a string passed in. We're going to go ahead and say, for instance, logger getting a user ID. So every get request, we're going to go ahead and log that message up here in the server. So let's go ahead and upload that file. Do, do, do. Copy that long string. Again, this is, oh. Haha. <laughs> Thank you everyone for catching my mistake. One more thing. Actions file. And so this is going to be called actions.js. And we need to go ahead and actually handle the upload of that. So let's go ahead and handle that. Again, we do the exact same thing. We parse it as JavaScript. We upload it. Everything is good. So restart that again. And let's paste in our uploading actions.js. That should return OK. Perfect. And now let's go ahead and we expect, if we go ahead and curl, that we will get back on the client side, which is this bottom window, we'll get back the user profile. And on the top window, we'll see a line that says, getting a user ID. So let's verify that. Error unauthorized. Ah, well, nerd snipe myself. We'll change that condition back. This is the fun of serverless though, right? No server restarts. This could be running anywhere. We will re-upload our rules. Cool, so OK. We can change it back. Get request, name Mike, logging, getting a user ID. That was cool, right? We just executed arbitrary JavaScript on my server. Um, wow, that's terrifying. Uh, let's go ahead and change the additional functionality. I want to go ahead and now know when that happened. So date dot now, and then we have to go ahead and properly escape that. Cool. That's not going to work. Um, doo -doo -doo. Yeah, no, that'll be fine. OK, so we go ahead and redeploy our actions. And we should go ahead. And if everything works as planned, we'll go ahead and do that original request. And wow, oh my god, we went ahead and changed it again. We can change our behavior just by uploading arbitrary code. That gets executed instantly. Yay, thank you. Exactly, one person claps. Um, so there we go. We went ahead and built an entire serverless framework in like 25 minutes, right? So it's easy. Everything's done. Um, you can actually go ahead and deploy this as well. 
Um, I have a version deployed, um, though I guarantee you someone has probably already like dumped my environment and stolen all of my keys. Um, because again, I'm allowing arbitrary JavaScript. Um, probably not a great idea in the real world. So going back, we did the live coding. Um, again, in conclusion, we can take a server and add some magic. And that magic is authorization via identity as a service or some other configurable provider that you can have a developer you know, give you some secure information and run it against that. You have authorization. So we wrote our own kind of mini authorization language that was pretty much just JavaScript um, that we would go ahead and evaluate and allow you to go ahead and make decisions based on that. And then we went ahead and built uh, a super tiny, terrible functions as a service where you could upload a JavaScript file and execute bits and pieces of that. Um, and that's what kind of we define as serverless, is the ability to go ahead and directly from the client do all of these incredibly powerful things. Um, so a little bit of real talk. How many people went to Charity's thing yesterday? Did anyone? Cool. Um, this, is a, this is a card. I was actually playing this game with my roommates. It's called uh, DevOps Against Humanity. Have you guys played Cards Against Humanity? This is probably my favorite uh, answer to this question. Developers do not get access to production machines because uh, doing terrible things uh, is the short answer. Um, and serverless, some of these things kind of, I feel like, promote a little bit more of those terrible things, right? Like, I'm evaling JavaScript. Um, I'm running arbitrary code. Um, People also treat config differently than they treat code. So that JSON file that we uploaded that's changing your rules, that changes the behavior of your server. You shouldn't treat that lightly. Um, at Google, like a vast majority of our outages are caused by config pushes. Like code is well tested. You write unit tests, you have integration tests. Config, people just are like, hey, it'll change something and you know it'll probably be harmless. Um, it's not. Make sure that as you're building serverless frameworks, there are some serious problems that, that have been brought up of orchestration and deployment. So how do you go ahead and deploy tons of microservices and ensure that all of their configuration is in sync? Um, I think these are the problems that uh, we talked some about the past of serverless. Um, it's super easy to go ahead and build a serverless framework. Those are the things that we at Firebase are working on as we move forward of how do we go ahead and orchestrate all of these different services that are serverless? And how do you go ahead and do you know, Firebase deploy and deploy all of these things so that they're all in sync and so that you can um, you know, for instance, does anyone know how to do traffic splitting on microservices? Like, you have no idea, right? Because your, your functions may spin up or spin down at any point, and you have no idea because they're all stateless, who's doing what? You have no idea if you can go back to the same function. Um, those are the problems that we're, we're trying to solve, that you know, maybe it's another layer of config, maybe it's more code. Um, but that's kind of, in the last couple minutes, what we think is the future of serverless, because we just did the past in about 20 minutes. Cool, and as always, uh, let me know what you build. Um, I'm on Twitter at ASCII Mike. Um, the code will be up on GitHub when it's a little more secure. I'm gonna try and clean up some of the arbitrary JS evaluation stuff. Um, I'm on GitHub and other things. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. I would love to hear what you guys build and what you guys think of the talk uh, and what you think of Firebase. So with that, any questions? You're all stunned into silence by the fact that I'm just evaling things on a server. I don't blame you. No? Okay. Well, thank you all very much, and I'll be around after. Okay.